Now that we learned how to name cycloalkanes without substituents, we're going to bring in some substituents and learn how to name those. Um, now, you'll find that now that we've established the basic rules for organic nomenclature, these are going to be very repetitive, and there will only be minor changes to the different versions. Um, so if we have a cycloalkane with only one substituent, um, in the straight chain alkanes, we had to think about whether we're going to number these carbons left to right or up or down or which direction we're going to go in. This is a cycle, right? Which means that you can select any of these carbons to be carbon one. And since our rule is always to give substituents the lowest possible number, well, of course, the carbon that contains the substituent will be carbon one. Um, and that's understood. So there's really no reason to indicate numerically where that substituent appears if there's only one of them because it's always gonna be carbon one. So in that instance, we don't really bother with numbering it. We're just going to list the substituent name and then tack on the parent name at the end. Um, now the cycle is always going to be the parent name here. And I see that this one contains six carbons and it's cyclic. So the parent name will be cyclohexane. And there is a substituent with one carbon on it. So that substituent will be called methyl. And I don't have to indicate numerically where it appears because it's understood to be on carbon one. So that name will just become methyl cyclohexane. Now, if we have more than one substituent, um, then we do have to indicate where exactly those appear on that cycle. Um, and if there are two or more substituents of the same priority, then we're going to start by numbering the carbons to give all of the substituents the lowest possible number, as usual. And if there is a tie and the substituents have the same priority, then we're going to break that tie using alphabetical order, just like we did with the straight chain alkanes. All of the other rules will be exactly the same. Um, so if you have those down, then this won't be too bad. Let's try some examples. Um, here I see that there is a molecule with six carbons. So this is a cyclic alkane with six carbons. So right off the bat, I can say the parent will be cyclohexane. And then I have to figure out how I'm going to number this. Um, and I know I'm going to give one of these substituents carbon one. Right, because I want to give all of them the lowest possible number. So I'll definitely start right here. I'm going to call this carbon one, and then I can go counterclockwise. Alternatively, I could have started here and then gone clockwise. So I can add this. We can go clockwise, which is this direction or counterclockwise. And which direction you choose will really depend on what kind of numbering you get. Um, so here I have to decide which direction I want to go in. And since this is a, an alkyl group and this is a halogen, we know that these have the same naming priority. So here I have to use alphabetical order to break that tie. This is bromo. And this is methyl. Well, bromo comes first alphabetically, so I'm going to prioritize it when numbering, and I'm going to make this carbon one, not this carbon. So I'm going to delete this. I don't want this version. The other scenario I wanted to show you, so there's an additional way this can go wrong. So here's another thing you don't want to do. What if I had gone ahead and I decided to number this carbon one, I alphabetized it, and I did it accordingly, um, according to alphabetical order. What if I went clockwise instead? Notice that that would not be a good option because then I would have substituents on carbons one and carbon five, whereas here I have carbons one and carbon three. So you have to decide which carbon will be carbon one, and then you have to be careful with, with whether you go counterclockwise or clockwise, and that will be determined by the orientation of the substituents. So in short, 
give all the substituents the lowest possible number. Okay, this is my numbering system. So I'm gonna add in the carbon numbers. I see that bromo appears on carbon one, methyl appears on carbon three. And after that, it's the same system we saw before. I'm going to list these in alphabetical order when I'm putting them into the final molecule name. So I will call this one bromo, three methyl, cyclohexane. And that's the full name of this molecule. Let's try another one. Okay, I see here the parent is also cyclohexane, right? It has six carbons connected in a cycle, cyclohexane. And here the numbering is very easy because, well, I see that there are two substituents attached to the same carbon, so I'm going to call that carbon one. Now, don't let this throw you off. Um, in the previous or the first example, we saw that when there was one methyl group, we didn't need to number that because there was only one substituent. But be careful here because there are two substituents here. Sure, they appear on the same carbon, but they are two individual substituents. So here I do want to number them. I'm going to call this 1-1 one, one to indicate that they're both attached to the same carbon. And then I want to say dimethyl to indicate that I have two methyl groups in this molecule. Methyl because, well, each one of them contains only one carbon. So that becomes 1-1 one, one dimethyl cyclohexane. Let's take a look at a couple more examples. And I'll show you exactly why we needed to number this. So there are two methyl groups. Here they happen to be on the same carbon, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. What if I had two methyl groups that were in different carbons? And that's why it's important to indicate the numbering system um, to show where they are exactly. Um, so here, numbering is actually, there are four different versions you could do. So I'm always going to start by giving one of the substituents the lowest possible number. So I could go one, two, three, four, five, and six clockwise. Um, alternatively, I could have called this carbon one and gone counterclockwise. Or I could have called this carbon one and gone counterclockwise. And finally, I could have gone, called this carbon one and went clockwise. Okay, we can eliminate two of these options very quickly because notice in these examples, I have substituents on carbons one and three. In the examples on the right, I have substituents on carbons one and five, and I don't want that. I want the substituents to have the lowest possible number. So I'm gonna get rid of these. In the previous two examples, I see, well, it really doesn't matter which order I go in because this molecule is symmetric. So whether I use this version or this version, I'm going to generate the exact same name. So it doesn't matter. I'm just going to pick one. I see that there are six carbons connected in a cycle. So the parent is cyclohexane. And then I have a methyl group on carbon one and a methyl group in carbon three. So I'm going to call these one, three, dimethyl. And then I'm gonna put these together into the full name, one, three, dimethyl cyclohexane. Let's take a look at the next one. Um, I see that the cycle contains four carbons. So the parent will be called cyclobutane. And now I have a couple of options for numbering. I'll try both and then I'll get rid of the one I don't like. Um, so I could call this carbon one. And notice here that whether I go clockwise or counterclockwise doesn't matter because this is symmetric. So if I had gone in the other direction I would still end up generating the same system. Or I could have called this carbon one 
and continued down the chain. Um, and again, I could have gone counterclockwise. I would end up generating the exact same numbering pattern. Okay, now I have to decide, well, which carbon will be carbon one? And notice here that I have a tie because in either scenario, I have substituents on carbons one and three. So in order to break that tie, I have two alkyl groups, and if there is a tie, I'm going to use alphabetical order to break that tie. So this substituent contains two carbons, which means it's called ethyl. This substituent contains one carbon, so it's called methyl. And well, E comes before M alphabetically, so I want to give the carbon attached to the ethyl group carbon one and I'm gonna get rid of this numbering system. Okay, and now we're almost there with our name. I see that the ethyl group is attached to carbon one, so I'll call that one ethyl. The methyl group is attached to carbon three. I will call that three methyl. And to put all of that together, E comes before M alphabetically, so I'm going to list the ethyl group first in the name. And that will become one ethyl, 3-methyl cyclobutane. Let's try the next one. All right, this one looks a little funny. It looks like it has arms. Um, so this one's a little bit trickier because now we have to remember our substituents that have structural isomers. So if you forgot how to do that, go back and take a look at the video that talks about naming alkyl groups with structural isomers so that you can remind yourself of what the system is and what these look like. Okay, I see that the cycle contains five carbons. So right off the bat, I'm gonna name the parent. Five carbons, it's cyclic. I'm gonna call it cyclopentane. And then I need to identify what my substituents are. Um, so this one right here is tert butyl. And again, if you don't remember that, go back and check out that video on naming alkyl groups with structural isomers. This one is isopropyl. And now I have to decide how I'm going to number these. I'm definitely gonna give one of them carbon one and then I'm going to go either clockwise or counterclockwise to give the next substituent the lowest possible number, which will be carbon 3. If I had gone in the other direction, so if I did this, then notice that the substituents would be on carbons 1 and 4 versus 1 and 3. So I want to use the version on the left. I want a 1-3 pattern. Ooh, I'm deleting too much here. Okay. Alternatively, I could have called this carbon one and gone clockwise to give the next substituent carbon three. And now I have to decide which one I'm going to prioritize. So which one's gonna get carbon one? And again, here I have two equally ranking substituents. There is a tie because in either case, I'm going to have a substituent on carbon one and a substituent on carbon three. So I'm gonna use alphabetical order, but here we have to be really careful because most prefixes are not considered when determining alphabetical order. So in tert butyl, we're actually ignoring the tert. We're gonna alphabetize this by B. In isopropyl, iso is the only, subs only prefix that is considered when alphabetizing. So I'm alphabetizing this by B and I not T and I, so just be careful with that. And while B comes before I alphabetically, so I want to give the tert butyl carbon one, which means I'm gonna get rid of this version on the right. Okay, now we're almost there. So I see the tert butyl will be one tert butyl. Isopropyl will be three isopropyl. And then I'll put those together. And I'm going to note, well, B comes before I alphabetically, so I'm going to list the tert butyl first, and that will become 1 tert butyl, 3 isopropyl, 
cyclopentane. Okay. And let's try one last one. Okay. This one looks a bit intense. Don't let it scare you. Same sort of system that we've been using before. Um, first, I'm going to identify the parent name, and I see that this cycle contains seven carbons. So the parent will be called cycloheptane. And now I have to figure out the numbering system. Um, I'm going to call this carbon one because there are two substituents attached to it, which means I automatically get two substituents with the lowest possible number. So that will definitely be carbon one. Then I have to figure out how I'm going to number the rest. And let's try a couple different versions and then we'll take a look. So now that I know which carbon is carbon one, I really only have two options. I could either go clockwise or counterclockwise. All right, if I go clockwise, then of course we have substituents in carbon one in either case. Um, but if I go clockwise, the next substituent appears on carbon four. If I go counterclockwise, the next substituent appears on carbon three. And that is the lower version. So I'm going to select the version on the left and get rid of the version on the right. And now I'll go through and name all my substituents. I see that there are two methyl groups attached to carbon one, so I will call, call those 1,1-dimethyl. Then there is a fluoro on carbon five, I'll call that 5-fluoro. And then there's a bromine on carbon three, so that would be 3-bromo. To put all of those together, I'm going to go by alphabetical order. Um, with fluoro and bromo, it's easy. I'm going to alphabetize these according to, well, the first letter in the name. With dimethyl, I have to keep in mind that the prefix di is not considered when alphabetizing. So I'm alphabetizing this by M. And then I see, well, bromo comes first alphabetically. So I'm going to call this 3-bromo. 5-fluoro comes next alphabetically. And then 1-1-dimethyl, one, one dimethyl, and I am running out of space here. This is a long name. Okay, it becomes 3-bromo, 5-fluoro, 1-1-dimethyl, cycloheptane. Just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't